Uh, my name's Simon, I'm from the Loki Project. I'm joined today by Jonathan, and there's a few other members of our team floating around as well. Um, basically, we um, are a fork of Monero that is using the blockchain to sell, uh, create a self-regulating uh, mixed net. Uh, and through that mixed net, you'll also be able to send um, messages through a decentralized serverless architecture, um, effectively giving everyone access to anonymous communications that doesn't rely on some third party server like Signal or WhatsApp or et cetera. And everything's open source, so it can all be uh, validated by a third party or by yourselves as well. Um, so that's us in a very quick nutshell. We'll move on to the demo pretty quickly in case things stop working and things take longer than expected. We'll probably just cut it if it does. But um, the unfortunate thing is here is that that's the laptop that we were going to do the demo on, but its HDMI isn't working, which is like the last piece in the puzzle. So now we have the other one that's not really doing a whole lot. Yeah. So we're going to um, wing it a little bit. For we are going to wing it a little bit. The process um, is a lot similar. So to explain what's going on here, um, this software here is uh, called LokiNet. And what LokiNet is, it's a brand new uh, onion routing protocol uh, written by a guy who we simply know as Jeff, but some of you might know by his name PSI if you've had any interaction with I2P over the last few years. Um, uh, basically, he wanted to answer the question, what would I2P look like if it was rewritten in the, today? Um, and so f since, I think it's been like since February or March uh, in 2018, he's just been working nonstop um, on this new protocol, which essentially allows for direct IP tunneling using some new cryptography as well. So it's a lot faster than I2P and it allows for um, a very wide variety of um, networking protocols as opposed to Tor, which is strictly TCP, I believe, um, and uses SOX proxies and weird things. But we can do all sorts of things on this network, like run new DNS servers. And he, he, he reckons it can replace the internet. I think that's a little bit optimistic <laughs> personally. Um, but it's kind of cool because this, is, this protocol could be used to directly plug into something like a mesh network, which would give it um, onion routing functionality straight out of the box, meaning that uh, whenever you use it, your exact location on that mesh network is always obfuscated, which is pretty cool. Um, but for more general purposes, uh, this software can simply be described to uh, do kind of what a VPN does. Who knows what a VPN does? Yeah. Do what a VPN does in a decentralized and trustless way. And it does this by um, connecting multiple random computers together in such a way that uh, they only know where a packet has come from and where it is going to next. So if you have uh, five people in, in a circuit or a path or whatever you want to call it for your protocol, um, you have yourself who knows the full state of the chain. Um, you have the next one that knows um, where you are and where the next computer is. You have the middle one which knows where the first hop is and the third hop is. You have the third one which knows where you're going but doesn't know who you are. And so through the, um, this distributed network of nodes, you can create these anonymous paths through to the wider internet or uh, various applications or whatever the hell you want to do. So. That's onion routing in a nutshell. We didn't invent this. This has been around for a long time. If anyone's used Tor, they've used onion routing before. Who's used Tor? Yeah. Yeah, quite a few of you, which is good to know. Um, so what we're going to do today, uh, Jonathan has been writing up some guides about uh, the public testing phase of LokiNet because we're sort of getting to that point now. Um, so we're basically going to run you through how you could jump on and test out this software with us if you really wanted to. So... Um, we're going to start by connecting to the secret LokiNet IRC uh, mm -hmm. snap, which is a thing that you can only access through LokiNet. Um, and this is actually a pretty cool demonstration of what this software can do, uh, purely because using IRC requires a fairly stable connection, um, which is something that we're able to provide out of the box, even though our software is extremely new and very unoptimized and full of bugs and other things, mm -hmm. which we may witness today, but let's not go there. This is just to show the actual server's IP is a .loki address, which means that if we try and connect to it without running our daemon, we just won't be able to connect. As you can see, it host not found. It's going to check in 10 seconds. But if we run our Loki net daemon, it'll it's found the server, or it's looking for it still. This is risky business here. I don't know. It is. Um, the cool thing about this is we have these two um, different top-level domains. We have .loki and .snode, which refers to specific nodes on our network. Um, 
And essentially, how this works is if you want to use LokiNet, you can shove anything over the .loki top level domain and it will just handle it in the background through um, DNS adapters and that sort of thing, depending on what operating system you're using. So it makes things really easy because then uh, the software that you're using doesn't actually have to know that LokiNet even exists. It just routes stuff through IP or, um, as it normally would, which is pretty cool. Um, cool, so I'll get Simon to jump oh. onto the IRC chat now. <laughs> and we have a few people in the channel at the moment. They're inactive because they're mostly American. That's where all of the Loki net. Jeff, uh, Jeff appeared like a minute ago. Ooh, hopefully he's still there. Um, have you guys are using Tamlin already? Uh, sort of. <laughs> 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 no, not really. It's um, it's in a bit of an unstable state at the moment. Um. So the latency on this thing at the moment is sitting at about two seconds through that 160 computers in grand total. Um, but the cool thing about this is the IRC server doesn't know um, either of our actual IP addresses and we don't know the IP address of the IRC server. So this is pretty much just a hidden service if you've come across that sort of thing before. Um, so that's, that's how to connect to the, um, to the uh, IRC snap that we've developed, but we want to show you just how easy it is to launch your own snaps or in hidden services on LokiNet just as you would any other mixnet. So Jonathan, is am I hosting? Yeah, there's a terminal already open, you just have to click up and serve. What? So right now all I'm going to be doing is running a command that I set before. It's just a Python free command that's, that binds an index file to an IP address and a port on my computer. But the daemon or the software knows to connect that to the .loki address. Effectively, if you can run a website, you can run a snap. So there's lots of possibilities about what you could do. I mean, there's been lots of previous examples, you know, various forums and marketplaces and things like that. Um, but for any website or any web application that privacy is desirable for, uh, this sort of technology is very useful. Yeah. So I've already got Simon's .loki address. I just pulled it from his name, where he's connecting from. That's where he's serving it to. Um, you can also host many snaps on the same server or computer. Um, just so happens that we binded it to the same .loki address. And this can be temperamental at times. Basically, we pulled the front page of the Flex Daps website off their website and posted it on our thing. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Woo. And that's totally what you're seeing right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Pick oh. up a title. That's all it can pick up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess we'll go to question. Oh, wait, are we going to do the torrent thing? Probably not the torrenting. No, okay. No. Um, but that's another feature that we can do over the mixnet. BitTorrent um, works out of the box, which is pretty cool. That's um, yeah. We've also got a server running. Do, this we, is probably do you need already... to buy the BTT token to access? I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll go to questions now if you, anyone has any. Up the back there, gentleman with the glasses. Does, does the assistance and access bill change the way you're going to run the project? Great question. Uh, we poured over that bill, and the shorter answer is no. The reason is because all of our stuff is open source anyway, and the powers that uh, the assistance and access bill gives government agencies doesn't actually allow them to do anything that they already can't oh. do just by close. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Don't use 4G with LokiNet, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, cool. So it works great. <laughs> Jeff will be pleased, I'm sure. Um, no. <laughs> yes? How does your cryptocurrency come into play? How does our cryptocurrency come into play? Uh, well, the way that our network is authenticated, I, I mentioned before how uh, that we're using the Monero blockchain forked thing called Loki to self-regulate this network. And essentially, um, if you know what a relay is, you'll know that um, it allows you to pass around other people's information and, and through that you can glean information off them. So effectively, 
uh, by requiring that the nodes that are staking on the Loki network are the only ones that are allowed to become relays, we effectively mitigate against cyber attack. Um, so we basically solve that problem, provided that the economic assumptions we've made about that are actually correct, um, which is something that I'm pretty sure no one else is doing at the moment, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, Oh, JP is um, showing us a list of um, service nodes that are currently operational on the Loki mainnet. Um, yeah, which is something. He basically is just going to show that we've already got this network set up, um, so the economic assumptions seem to be working. All we have to do is build in tests to make sure that people are actually running Loki net and doing as they're supposed to, and then write rules so that the network can actually self-regulate itself. So bring in small groups of these nodes, make them check each other's work, and if it's good, then it's all good. Otherwise, if they widely agree that the node is doing bad work, it can get voted off. There's a lot of ins and outs and implementation details that are really, really important about that, but if you're interested in that, you can read our white paper, I'm not gonna go into it now. Uh, if you have a, so let's say you're going up against a state-based actor mm -hmm. um, who doesn't pay, has a relatively large budget, what kind of resistance do you have to then well, it, it's literally just the monetary cost. And the way I like to think about this is if the usage of this network is high enough such that it becomes a valuable target for a state actor, it becomes more and more and more expensive. And there's also, um, there's also a phenomenon where the, because there is a limited supply of Loki available, it's not a linear cost. As they continue to purchase more and more of the network to try and attain more and more nodes in order to be able to do effective surveillance on it, the effective price to do that gets higher and higher and higher. So it really depends on their price tolerance. And like you can model it a million different ways because there's a million different variables that can go into this. But I'll put it this way. The back of the notepad calculations that I did put the cost of completely undermining surveillance, uh, the uh, privacy features of Tor cost you about $50,000 a month, which for a large organization such as, well, you name it, any government agency basically is you know, it's peanuts. It's really not that much if you really care about even just one case, like $50,000 a month might be worth it. So um, really, we have a significantly higher uh, capital outlay cost to undermine this compared to what's already out there. It's not perfect um, and it does scale better when there are more users and when there are more relays. So, mm. yeah. Um, another good example would um, be imagine if there's a hundred Loki in circulation and the staking requirement is one. There's a max amount of nodes that can be on the network at any given time. At that time, it's a hundred. Um, so if you start getting up to like 70% lockup, it's nearly impossible uh, to undermine the network, perform any tempo temporal analysis. We don't have the maths to back that up, but it's... Well, no, it's pretty simple. You need approximately 30 to 40% to be able to do any sort of effective temporal analysis. If there's only... 20% of the circulating supply left, then you just simply cannot do it. That's unlikely to be the case, but it proves, proves the argument, if, if you know what I mean. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Real quick? How do you think like BitTorrent will perform? BitTorrent will perform? Yeah. Oh, not as well. I yeah, mean, I was going to say, like, <laughs> do, 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 do they, I mean, is there any handshaking that could hand off to like peer-to-peer, -peer, like peer-to-peer -peer connections over BitTorrent or like into something more performant? Or will, will all of the actual traffic have to go through the, the I, I mean, you would have to still do a three hop connection to get the privacy benefits. That's yeah. just the reality of it. And yeah. so it, straight away you're dealing with um, approximately speaking, having to route it through three different geographical locations and in between each of those three geographical locations. Like right now, if you connect to, Facebook's a bad example, um, let's say, uh, let's go Facebook. They have local CDNs, so this kind of makes it a moot point. But let's pretend they didn't. Yeah. You'd be using like 16 different computers between here and the States to get to um, Facebook. And so already you can see that that's going to be quite a bit of latency. And that's definitely going to be the case with LokiNet, and that's already the case with every other um, onion routing network out there. Yeah. So right. you're just bouncing between different geographical locations. That's going to increase your latency. That's going to reduce the amount of bandwidth that you can put through the thing. We're doing what we can to optimize the cryptography and, and um, all of the packet handling as well to make it as good as you can, but it's just going to be inherently slower. That's yeah. the reality. Yeah, yeah, We've yeah. also got um, bandwidth tests eventually. It's not developed at the moment. I think Simon might have mentioned it. I'm not too sure. 
um, where if you have the stake and you're also meeting the bandwidth limit, mm -hmm. then you're allowed to be a node. Right. Yeah. Was, yeah. It's yeah. like, I mean, at least thought, I'm just curious how much thought, but yeah. I guess we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing new in that regard. Yeah. <laughs> Um, any last quick ones? I know everyone's probably hankering for another beverage. I know I am. Awesome. Well, thanks for having us, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.